Hey everybody, I'm John T. I'm also an astronomer here at USQ. And what I'll be telling you about today is the whole story of planet formation. How planets form, where they come from, and in particular, the role that collisions, impacts, explosions take in shaping the planets that we know in our own planetary system and the planets that we here at USQ are discovering around other stars. Before I do that though, I thought I'd give you a little insight into the life of a roving astronomer. I'm an astronomer, I'm obviously not Australian by my accent, I'm a Brit. And I wanted to be an astronomer since I was a very, very small child. This picture of me, five years old, highly excited, visiting Jodrell Bank Observatory, a radio telescope, very famous, about 30 or 40 miles, 60 or 70 kilometers from where I grew up. Really exciting day as a five-year-old, I got to go and visit this fantastic radio observatory, wander around, pose for photos in front of this big telescope and basically really enjoy myself. I very quickly, even at age five, decided that this was what I really wanted to do. This was my hobby, this was my passion. And so I joined my local astronomy society about the age of eight or nine. One of the beauties of that was that every single month, astronomers like myself, like Belinda, like Brad, would come and give us talks, would tell us about the work that they were doing. And they also gave me invaluable advice on what I needed to do from being a small child, fascinated by astronomy, to get the opportunity to become an adult doing their hobby as their career, which is one of the most wonderful gifts I've ever been given. Following this advice, I started my undergraduate studies at the University of Durham in the north of England. Durham's a beautiful old cathedral town, very small city, only about 50,000 people, but it's one of the most beautiful parts of the UK. It's also a very prestigious university, and I was very fortunate to get a place there. I spent four years at Durham studying physics and astronomy, came out with a degree, and then moved on and went to the University of Oxford. This is a beautiful photograph of the college I studied at, at Oxford, Lincoln College. Spectacular place. And I spent three years there studying for my PhD, my Doctor of Philosophy, looking at the small objects in our solar system, working out where they come from and where they go. I completed my PhD and left the UK. I moved and took my first job overseas at the University of Bern in Switzerland. So for a period of three years, every day when I left work, this was my view. I left work, walked out of the front doors of the Physikalisches Institut in Bern, looking out over the city towards the distant Alps. Absolutely beautiful. And I feel so privileged that astronomy has given me the opportunity to go and work in such wonderful places. When my time in Bern finished, I moved to a slightly less wonderful place in Milton Keynes, the Open University. Milton Keynes is famous within the UK. It's essentially the British equivalent of Canberra has good sides and bad sides, but it's a crafted town, one that was built with a lot of planning and is a very strange place. Spent three years there before finally moving out to Australia. And when I moved to Australia, I lived and worked in Sydney at the University of New South Wales. Had three years there before Brad finally invited me to come and work here at the University of Southern Queensland, where I came early 2014 and have been ever since. I think that's enough about the history of me. I think now it's time to move on and tell you the story of planet formation. And this is a very good point before I get too much into the nitty gritty to give you a little bit of an idea of something very unusual about science. We as people live in a world that is infinitely complex. Everything we see is so complicated it's really challenging to understand, but we're a very inquisitive species. We're also a very narrative species. We communicate by telling stories. You talk to your friends and they tell you the story of what they did yesterday or what they did last week, what they did on their holidays. And we as scientists work in a very similar way. When we try and understand this infinitely complex universe around us, we build stories in order to try and explain things. The difference between science and the fiction that you read is the way we craft these stories and what we do with them. We craft theories and a theory is our best current explanation of how things work. It is a story. It is a fairy tale, but it's a very powerful fairy tale because we can use these theories to make predictions. And the acid test for a theory for one of these stories are the tests that we can do of the predictions that that theory makes, that story. As a scientist, you've got to be very careful not to become too attached to your theories because it only takes one observation to disprove your theory, to shatter that idea and make you go away and come up with a new story to explain how things work. The best example I can give of this is imagine I have a coin. I have a coin and I want to flip it. What's going to happen? Well, I come up with a story. I say, when I throw the coin in the air, it will have one of two results. It will fall to earth and give me a head, or it will fall to earth and give me a tail. 
face up or face down? That's my theory. How do I test that? Well, I test that by getting coins, flicking them in the air and seeing what happens. I could toss my coin a million times and a million times I get either a head or a tail. And you think that's very strong evidence for the theory, but it still hasn't proved the theory correct because on the million and one time that I flip the coin, it might fall down and land on its edge, balance perfectly. Theoretically, this could happen. With our understanding of physics, that could happen. It's very unlikely, but if we had that happen in our one million and first measurement, that would disprove my theory that a coin has to hand, land heads or tails. In that case, I as a scientist have to throw my theory away and develop a new one, a better one. And that's how we progress in science. So a lot of the ideas that I'm going to be telling you today are our current best theories on how planets form. They're not the final story. They're probably not a perfect match to the actual process that goes on. But they're our current best explanation for the universe we see around us. And they're our best attempt at explaining the infinite complexity we have with our minds that are only a finite complexity. I can't fit the entire universe into my head. All I can do is break it into manageable pieces. So with all that in mind, I'm going to take you now on the fairy tale, the story of how we think planets formed. And our story starts here. This is a very good example of a nebula, a place where stars are being born. As you saw when you studied the galaxies, in a galaxy like our own, a spiral galaxy, there are blue arms spiralling out, and dotted through those blue arms are dark clouds of gas and dust, congregated, blocking out the light from behind them because there's so much gas and dust there. These dark molecular clouds float around our galaxy, all over the place. If you go out on the night sky in the winter, look out from a dark site and look at the Southern Cross, you'll see a dark patch in the night sky next to it, known as a coal sack. That's one of these dark clouds. We see it because it blocks the light from the stars behind. Every now and then, though, one of those dark clouds will be nudged by a passing star, by a supernova explosion, and that will cause the cloud to begin to collapse. And as you were told when you were learning about the stars, when a cloud of gas collapses, it forms stars. The gas collapses smaller and smaller, buried in this dark cloud, until eventually you get stars that are born. And when the stars are born, they throw off material, gas, into space, a stellar wind, and blow a bubble, clearing a bubble, in the cloud from which they were born. What you're seeing here is the end result of that process. You're seeing a stellar nursery, seeing the Orion Nebula. And this huge pink area that you're looking into, this huge cavity, is a bubble that has been cleared by a small group of stars right in the center here called the trapezium. These stars formed just a million years or so ago and have been violently blowing their winds out into space, clearing a bubble in the interior of this huge dark cloud. Eventually, that bubble's blown all the way out so it's broken through the cloud surface. And you're now looking at the cavity that has been opened up by these stars, looking into that hole. And the pink you're seeing is the inner edges of that cavity, looking at these stars that have been newly born. And that's the first part of the planet formation process. These youthful stars in this cluster will have planets forming around them as we speak. So that's the story of how we think stars form. And you've heard a bit more about that earlier on. What's of interest for our story today, in this session, is how planets form around those useful stars. So as a star is coming together, as a star's forming, a lot of material is collapsing in onto that youthful star. And that material will have some vestigial spin, some spin left over from the nudge that started the cloud collapsing. As you shrink it down further and further, the conservation of angular momentum means that it will spin quicker and quicker. Now, that's a very sciencey way of saying things, but it's something you'll observe in day-to-day -day life. If you've ever seen a figure skater or a ballerina starting to pirouette, spinning very slowly, and as they bring their arms in, they spin quicker and quicker. And if it's me, I then fall over because I'm not very good at spinning around. The same thing happens to clouds of material in space. As they collapse, any rotation they have gets quicker and quicker and quicker. The side effect of that is that the material doesn't fall in from all directions but rather collapses into a disk. Now, that seems a bit counterintuitive. If you're spinning things around, you're spinning them around all over the place. But this is something, again, that those of you who've ever made a pizza and had a bit of a play around with might be familiar with. If you want to make a pizza like one of the crazy professional chefs, you get a ball of dough and spin it around really quickly, and it flattens out into a pancake. So around our youthful stars with material falling into them, the material from which they're forming collapses into a disk. 
A very thin disk, it's very, very wide, stretches out many times further from the star than the Earth is from the Sun. A hundred times further from the star than our Earth is from our Sun. But it's very thin. It's only got a tiny little thin width. It's almost like looking at a sheet of paper end on. Very thin, very broad. And within that disk, you have a huge amount of gas and dust. And it's that gas and dust that goes on to form planets. Now, I know this sounds something like a fairy tale. You have this collapsing material forming disks. But thanks to the wonderful Hubble Space Telescope, we've actually seen this happening. What you're seeing here are images of many objects that the Hubble Space Telescope has observed in the Orion Nebula, the beautiful pink clam-like thing we saw a little bit earlier on. This is looking against the illuminated side of that cloud of gas and dust in that cavity. And what you're seeing are small sun-like stars illuminated, the disks around them illuminated by that young cluster in the middle that's clearing everything away with disks around them. Some of these you're seeing in silhouette. Against the background of the nebula, you're seeing the disks edge on. Two very good examples can be seen here. Others of these disks you're seeing much nearer to face on. You're seeing the full, very circular looking disk as we look directly at it. Some edge on, some face on. What you'll also see here, though, are that a certain number of these have tails flowing away from them. What's happening there is that the young hot stars in the cluster that cleared the bubble are blowing onto the disks and blowing them away, ablating them into space, burning the disks away from the stars. And in the long term, that will finish the planet formation process around those stars. But this is the evidence that we have that supports our theory, our fairy tale, of disks around stars in which planets form. So now we've seen that we actually have evidence of these disks around stars. How does all that dust and gas go from being dust and gas to being planets like the one on which we're stood? The story is a slightly complicated one. We're still working out the nitty gritty, so this again is never going to be the final version of the theory. It's something that's still in development. But in this disk of gas and dust, you have lots and lots of very small pieces of dust that are initially moving very slowly with respect to one another. They're all moving around the central star at very low speeds with respect to their neighbours. So when they collide with each other, even though they're incredibly fragile, they collide sufficiently slowly, they stick together you gradually build a bigger bit of dust. That bigger bit of dust is bigger, so it can run into more pieces of dust, and it gradually grows and grows and grows by eating its neighbours. You get cannibalism going on. Eventually, you form an object that's large enough that it can exert a significant gravitational pull on the things around it. Only needs to be a few kilometres across, just to have a little bit of a pull initially. And that means that the speed with which it devours things gets quicker and quicker and quicker. You build objects that are kilometres, tens of kilometres, hundreds of kilometres across. And the larger you go, the fewer objects you have. They're the biggest bullies. They're the things eating things up the quickest. Eventually, you reach the point where things are thousands of kilometres across. If you develop much beyond that, if you have enough material around and you reach something that's ten times the mass of the Earth, really big bit of dust, much bigger than the planet on which we stand now, the gravity from that planet is sufficiently strong to start hoovering up all of the gas in the local environment, all of the hydrogen and the helium. At that point, there's suddenly a lot more food, and the planet grows very rapidly. You get this runaway growth, leaving you with a planet like the giant planets we have in our solar system, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Closer to the star, there's less food around. There's no ice because you're too close to the star, it's too hot, which means things grow more slowly and you grow the terrestrial planets, planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Now, the time planets have to form is somewhat limited because eventually the star turns on. The star starts throwing out enough light and heat and a stellar wind to clear the disk around it and stall the planet formation process. And at this point, you're left with a planetary system in miniature. The star clears from the inside out, removes gas and dust. But anything larger than several metres across won't be pushed away by the stellar wind, by the stellar radiation, and so is left behind. So over the next period of time, all the debris that's left over continues to collide with one another and grow. And slowly, the system develops from what you see here to something a little bit more like the planetary system we reside in today. This is still a bit earlier, but you still have planets. You also have a lot of leftover debris. You have the material that could never quite form planets. 
maybe got too stirred by another nearby planet but didn't get eaten, didn't get devoured. That's where in our solar system we have things like the asteroid belt, like the trans-Neptunian objects. You can always look these things up, learn more about them, but those are the reservoirs of debris left over from planet formation in our solar system. As before, this sounds something of a fairy tale, but once again we have the evidence to support it. In fact, we've visited an ever-growing number of these pieces of debris that are left over from planet formation. At the bottom left of this image, you can see several asteroids. At the bottom right, you can see cometary nuclei, dirty snowballs. All of these are debris left over from the solar system's formation. The asteroids, the rocky things, most of the things on this figure, formed relatively close to the sun, too close for ice to be solid. It was too hot, the ice was all vapor, gas, and so you formed rocky and metallic objects. The cometary nuclei that you can see at the bottom right-hand corner are the leftovers from the areas where there was ice, and they're flung into the inner solar system by the effects of the planet's but this is a debris left over from the formation of the planetary system in which we reside now. That's where I'll finish this first segment. That's the story of planet formation up to the point you have planets. What I'll tell you about in the next short segment are the final and very catastrophic stages of planet formation that we think happened very early on after our sun cleared the debris away, before in a third segment telling you the ongoing story of the last dregs of planet formation. So in this first section, I've taken you through a little bit of a background about me as a scientist and the convoluted path I followed to come here to USQ. I've also taken you through a little bit of my own philosophy as to how we do science and why acknowledging that theories can change is a very important of our day-to-day -day life. I then went on to tell you all about planet formation, from the earliest days of a small disk around a newly forming star to the point at which that star turns on and clears the environment around it. What I'll tell you about in the next small section are the very violent events that we think happened just after that initial part of planet formation, before in the third short segment taking you through the more recent history of the tail end of the planet formation process. <laughs>